It's time for business in Emmanuel. Emmanuel Abayu, if you has joined me. Hello, Emmanuel. Hi, Easy. How are you today? I'm good. How about you? I'm fine, thanks. All right, take it away. Hello, good evening, and welcome to business. The receiver for Unibank Ghana has sued the former owner, CEO of the bank, and eight other shareholders for their unlawful actions which contributed to the collapse of the financial institution. In a writ of summons, Ni Amano Dudu said that Dr. Kwabna Dufour hold, Holder Holdings Limited, Integrated Properties, Dr. Kwabna Dufour II, Eko Nyaku Dazi Dennis, and Boatima Kakra Dufour Nyaku are jointly and severally liable for the repayment of 5.7 million Ghana cities together with applicable interest to the plaintiff. The receiver claims that the various transactions identified in this action and variously described in the statement of claim resulting in unlawful loans, the unlawful advances, the unlawful guarantees, as well as the acquisition of properties and assets in the name of the shareholders, their related interests and or connected persons are unlawful. Moving on, the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana has been explaining circumstances that led to the sanctioning of four audit firms for various infractions. Council member for the ICAG, Augustine Addo, in an interview with Joy Business, asserted that the four banks who were fined recently were not punished for contributing to the demise of some banks in the country. He noted the decision against the auditing firms was for non-disclosure and non-compliance with international standards and in no way contributed to the collapse of the five banks. Mr. Addo was speaking on the sidelines of the ICAG Accountancy Education Fair here in Accra. Auditing firms never played any role in the collapse of their banks. The banks collapsed on merit of their own non-compliance with governance systems and lack of monitoring from their regulator. The auditor's role never affected the collapse of their banks. Auditors are meant to give assurance to stakeholders as to whether the financial statement shows true and fair view. When we did examination of the work the auditors actually carried out, what we established was that, as I've already said, their role never compromised the running of the, uh, the, the banks. But we are giving them these sanctions or penalties to pay because we realized that in some aspects of their audit work, they did not comply with international standards and auditing. And we believe in that work that if any auditor carries out audit work, the work should be in compliance with international standards and auditing. At points in time, we saw that there were some few infractions, but of course, they never, never contributed to the demise of the banks. Auditors audit historical issues. The financial statements have been prepared based upon historical occurrences and events. And the bank's work actually, the auditor's work actually, is to make sure that the financial statements that have been prepared are actually fair and actually determined. A country's senior partner at Price Waterhouse Coopers, Vish Shabo, has also downplayed the impact the sanctioned audit firms could have on the industry's confidence. PwC says the sanctions were due to breach of some auditing principles. There are fears the latest action could affect confidence in the profession following recent banking sector cleanup. But Mr. Shabo tells Joy Business he would rather enhance confidence in their work. Of course, uh, no professional likes to see uh, a colleague, a uh, professional, uh, find, finding themselves foul of disciplinary proceedings. So yes, it's a, it's a matter of concern, but there's a big positive impact that perhaps we're missing here. Mm -hmm. And the big positive impact is that the Institute, the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana, uh, who regulates all of us, has taken firm measures to, to sanction uh, those firms or those audit teams that were found uh, to have fallen short in one or two areas. So I think that signal has been sent quite strongly. It re-emphasizes the need for all of us as professionals to stick to professional standards. Um, it's something that happens. Uh, in fact, in most professional bodies, I think they have ongoing disciplinary uh, proceedings where members are called to book if they fall short. And the whole idea is for every professional to sit up. Mm -hmm. This one perhaps has generated a, a lot of visibility because it's you know affecting the financial sector and all the impacts that we've seen. But I think ICA Ghana 
under normal circumstances, still holds these disciplinary hearings, just that perhaps we don't hear about it as much as we have this one. So I look at it more from a positive perspective, that it's uh, a reflection of the institute doing uh, its job to make sure that uh, all of us as professionals, when we do work, it meets the required standards. Away from that, government is being urged to lead the cashless economy agenda by investing in educating the youth to become more tech savvy. According to Senior Vice President of, for Sales and Marketing for Dream Oval, Charles Colo, shaping the minds of upcoming youth is the best way to ensure more people get to understand and adopt digital payment systems. He was speaking on the sidelines of Day 2 of Mobex Africa Tech Expo and Innovation Awards. Here's more in this report. According to a UNDP report, Africa has the youngest population in the world. The population of Africa's youth is estimated to more than double by 2025. According to Charles Kulo, who is the Senior Vice President for Sales and Marketing for Dream Oval, this can serve as a great channel for promoting digitization on the continent. From a government perspective and from a, um, an education perspective, we teach these kids from the younger age to appreciate cash light, appreciate uh, technology and uh, digital uh, currencies and this type of uh, solutions. Then in 50 years old, that will be the easy, uh, easy path to the cash light or cashless society because 50% of the society will be understanding these solutions. This is the way for, for me you can get to a cashless society, cash light society by investing in education and making sure that the kids today are, uh, are sensitive about technology. This is absolutely important for the growth of our country in Ghana and for the growth of the continent in Africa. The Senior Vice President for Sales and Marketing for Dream Oval was speaking on the sidelines of Day 2 of the Mobex Africa Tech Expo and Innovation Awards 2019, which was under the theme E-Finance, Future of Payments and Banking. Touching on the theme, Security Analyst at Ecobank E-Process, Kafu Adabunu, urged government to implement policies necessary for ensuring safety and streamlining activities within the digital financial space. In the space, I think government is coming up with a recent uh, Bank of Ghana cyber directive, okay, which is now the banks are beginning to take these things more seriously. They are beginning to wake up and say that, okay, we need to do A, B, C, D. So once these policies are in place and they are fully implemented, then people will have no option. They will have no option. The bank, you know, I can't do A, B, C, D if A, B, C, D is not in place. So the policies will have to be there. We've started, but um, we need to be able to cover all the areas, regulations for the telcos, even in implementation of these mobile money and all these other things, the mobile financial services. For Joy Business, Sheila Tamaklo reporting. And in our local wrap tonight, Forestry Commission implements measures to stop rosewood exports. Details next. The Forestry Commission of Ghana is implementing enough measures to protect the country's forest resources, especially the illegal felling and exportation of rose root. According to Chief Executive Officer of the Forestry Commission, Kojo Owusu reports of institutionalized trafficking and exports of rose root are grossly exaggerated and are without basis. The Social Security and National Insurance Trust, SNET, has paid over 1.7 billion Ghana cities to more than 200,000 pensioners on the pension payroll as of July 2019. It has also reduced its average benefits processing time from 21 days in 2018 to 17 days and registered 106% of its targets leading to a sharp increase in the number of establishments contributions from 67,000 to over 68,000. The central management of Ghana's first last hill mall, Accra Mall, has announced the commencement of work to replace the entire ceiling of the mall. The project, which has been approved by the board of Accra Mall Limited, will start on Friday, September 6 and be completed by March 2020. And that's all in the first segment of Business News. I'm coming back after 8 p.m. with more business. Good evening.